Good evening. <laughs> uh, my name is Li Zhang. I'm professor of anthropology and the interim dean of social sciences here. Uh, it's my privilege uh, tonight to welcome uh, all of you to our seventh uh, Chevron lecture in public policy. So uh, some of you probably know uh, Steve Chevron. He was the dean of social sciences here from 1998 to 2008. Uh, so he and his wife, uh, Ajali, uh, established the Chevron Lectures in Public Policy uh, with a generous gift to the College of Letters and Science uh, on the occasion of uh, Steve's uh, retirement. So the endowment supports uh, an annual lecture on topics related to the social sciences and public policy that has a, a broad relevance to our students, our faculty, and the wider university community. So over the past seven years, uh, the Chevron Lecture Fund has brought uh, a, a group of distinguished scholars from across the social sciences disciplines uh, to UC Davis to share their work on a variety of uh, topics, for example, uh, health care reform, uh, government secrecy, immigration, polarization in American politics, poverty, um, the influence of debt on the Great Recession. So each of these talks has informed our thinking uh, on current and most uh, um, relevant issues on national uh, policy, uh, public policy. So uh, before I hand the microphone to David, who will introduce our speaker tonight, uh, I would also like to thank the Institute of Social Sciences uh, for organizing uh, this event and sponsoring this event. Um, Co-sponsorship was also kindly uh, uh, provided by the Department of Philosophy and the Herbert Young Society. Now finally, I also want to point out the updated Chevron lecture plaque here, okay? Um, <laughs> yes, uh, it's usually um, uh, hung in the social sciences uh, uh, dean's office and it bears a record of all the um, uh, lectures and so now, Professor Pettit's name has been added to it, so you will find a permanent home. Uh, it, no, no. <laughs> it will go back to the wall, but it's very nice, yes. Um, so yes, so his name will have a permanent home uh, at UC Davis. Uh, so now it's my pleasure to welcome Professor David Cobb, who uh, is the immediate past chair of philosophy department. He's very happy he's, he's on sabbatical leave actually right now. <laughs> so he will uh, 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 introduce our speaker, Professor uh, Pettit. So David, yeah. Thank you, Dean Zong. Um, it's an honor and a genuine pleasure to introduce Philip Pettit. Philip is Lawrence S. Rockefeller University Professor of Politics and the Center for Human Values at Princeton University, where he's the director of the program in political philosophy. These are all mouthfuls, so I have to make sure I'm going by my script here. He's also a distinguished professor of philosophy in the Research School of Social Science of the Australian National University. Raised and educated in Ireland, Philip has given distinguished lectures in many countries. He holds at least six honorary doctorates. I say at least because his CV is so long that you can never be sure you're counting correctly. Um, and he is a fellow or member of five national societies, including national academies rather, including the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Philip is best known for his work in political philosophy, but he has very broad and deep interests in philosophy. For example, in ethics, he has influentially defended a consequentialist theory, a relative of utilitarianism. Uh, in last year's Tanner lectures at UC Berkeley, he proposed a highly original new argument for an objectivist meta-ethical position. In philosophy of mind, he has defended functionalism. He's contributed to debates on the metaphysics or ontology of social entities, such as states and corporations. At the intersection of philosophy of economics and behavioral economics, 
He's written on the economy of esteem. In social choice theory, he discovered the discursive dilemma, a relative of Kenneth Arrow's impossibility theorem, and he argued for its significance to the theory of group agency, such as the agency of states and corporations. We can measure Philip's energy and the magnitude of his contributions by the numbers. In the past 20 years, he's published at least 10 single authored books. I say at least for the same reason. I'm not sure I'm counting correctly, but it's at least 10, I know that. And he's also published many um, jointly authored books and a flood of research papers. I gave up on counting the research papers except for one year. And I can tell you that so far in 2015, he's published at least 12 papers. The work that brings Philip here as this year's Schifrin lecture is his theory of freedom as non-domination, which he developed in his groundbreaking book, Republicanism, A Theory of Freedom and Government. The standard liberal account holds that freedom consists in non-interference. This liberal account argues that in a free society, governments would be minimal, avoiding interference with people's choices except to prevent people from interfering with each other. Philip argues, however, that non-domination is the single most important factor in our freedom. This view has important policy implications since it can justify a more interventionist government, one that works to prevent the domination of some citizens by others. Philip contends, for example, that severe economic inequality can undermine freedom by enabling some to dominate others. And he argues on this basis that concern with inequality can be justified by a concern with freedom, thereby undermining the sort of conventional political wisdom that there's a conflict between these two concerns. Philip's theory of freedom as non-domination has been enormously influential. His book has been translated into at least 15 languages. It influenced Jose Luis Zapatero, the Prime Minister of Spain between 2004 and 2011, to enlist Philip as an advisor. Philip's theory provided Zapatero with one of the central justifications he used for the political reforms he introduced in Spain. Given all of this, Philip obviously has a valuable perspective on issues of importance to public policy. And I should say that after his lecture, there'll be some time for questions from the audience. Please join me in welcoming Philip Pettit. Thank you very much, David. It's a real pleasure to be here, I must say, and it's been a, a joy all of today meeting various people and, and seeing the, um, this beautiful campus and town. So I'm also particularly privileged, I must say, to be, I understand, the first philosopher was a big burden of responsibility to give the Sheffron Lecture. Um, so a double honor, and thank you very much for inviting me. So I'm going to talk about um, the rights that we ought to give corporations, um, how extensive they are, and how limited they are or should be. Let me just begin with a little history, though, to, um, to prime you up, as it were, warm you up to the topic. And there's some great history here, it turns out. So, on the handout, which I think you all have, I begin with Blackstone, who's in the 1760s or so, writing the great volumes, The Laws of England, which are such a, an impact on English law and thought, but also American law and thought. But just going back a little bit before then, I mean, the notion of the corporate body as a person or an agent in its own right really goes back to the Middle Ages, at least. Arguably, there was some foreshadowing of it in Roman law, uh, but it's usually dated to, actually it's dated to 1246, which, when, uh, which is when the Pope then, uh, Innocent IV, who was a lawyer, uh, talked about corporations as persons. Uh, he described them as, each of them as a persona ficta, which is normally translated as a, a, um, a fictional person, uh, but can also be translated as an artificial person. And actually in the period when he introduced that notion of the corporation, the corporate body, I should say, meaning churches, guilds, monastic orders, parishes, towns, these were all of them corporate bodies in his sense. And he really wanted to argue that they couldn't be excommunicated, 
Um, there had been a practice in the church, apparently up to his time, under which you could excommunicate a town or a guild or any of these bodies. Now, what Innocent wanted to establish, he was a lawyer, very good mind, very keen sort of legal mind, was that this was a mistake. And you can see why it's a mistake. Excommunication was meant to mean that you were condemned to hell, you were outside the community of the church, uh, but these bodies did not have souls. And what he basically meant when saying each of them was a persona ficta was that it was a body, um, it was a person, a persona, but it was a person that was, did not have a soul, hence ficta, as a thing from a natural person. Actually, there were then two interpretations of ficta, what it meant. One was amongst the philosophers, Thomas Aquinas actually to the fore, who argued that ficta meant fictional, and so they weren't really persons at all, which meant not only could they not be found guilty, as it were, in theology and condemned to hell, but they couldn't be found guilty of legal offenses either and condemned to whatever penalty might be imposed upon them. On the lawyers, on the other hand, took a very different view. They translated, in effect, ficta. I mean, they didn't speak English, but this is my interpretation of how they took the word ficta. They took ficta in persona ficta to mean not a fictional or made-up body but a person, but rather an artificial person, a real person but artificial person. And they argued that these, these guilds and, and monastic orders, for that matter, and towns and parishes and so on, that they really were persons, but not persons with souls, of course. And how were they persons? Well, they were persons in the sense they could own things, like guilds owned lots of buildings, monastic orders owned buildings and so on, towns did. They could take you to court, or they could be taken to court, or they could enter contracts. They could perform like a persona or a person. So the notion of uh, the corporate agent or the corporate person was well and truly in place by the, say, the 17th century, when Thomas Hobbes, in chapter 16 of Leviathan, famously writes about the nature of these bodies. Um, about Hobbes' time, actually in 1657, under Cromwell, England introduces a law allowing a very particular sort of corporate body, which we came to be known as the joint company, or which we know as the corporation. And the big difference that the legislation 1657 brought in in England, it had earlier occurred, I understand, in Holland uh, under the Dutch Republic. Uh, the big difference was that um, prior to then, you, could, you did have what Hobbes actually in occasion calls a company of merchants, like the East India Company from England. And they were basically merchants who got together, sent off ships to sell the goods they had, uh, buy goods at the other side, and each basically took his, it was always his, own profit from the venture. Uh, they ganged together just for purposes of convenience. They were what we might call a partnership. And the thing about a partnership is a partner can pull out of the enterprise at any point and uh, take, his, take his resources, our profits and so on, and walk away. Thereby, of course, leaving the enterprise at the mercy of partners departing from it. What happened with the joint company is um, that the members of the company, unlike the members of the partnership, were forbidden to walk away. Their assets were locked in, as it was put, into the company. Of course, you say, well, wait a moment, couldn't they sell their shares? Well, they could do that, but notice that's different from walking away. It means that the corporate body is secure now in the funds that it has. No one can take his share or her share of the funds away they can sell them to somebody else, but then they're still in the company. That's when the joint stock company really in the tradition <clears throat> we belong to gets firmly established. A hundred years later, when, um, um, when Blackstone is writing the laws of England, um, he actually deals with corporate bodies in particular, and he identifies five legal rights, mainly corporations, five legal rights that they have. I've mentioned in the handout, one is a right to perpetual succession, which means to exist indefinitely into the future. Actually, that really turned on the medievals with the notion of the corporate person. And you can read about this in a classic work by Kantorowicz called The King's Two Bodies, where he describes how people living in a world where life was particularly short uh, could find a sort of sense of living forever on through their guild, you know, or their college, for that matter, their 
um, their university. Um, in any case, the first right is they can exist indefinitely into the future and own property indefinitely into the future. They don't necessarily die. Of course, they may die, but they don't necessarily die. A second right is to purchase lands. That's to own property, the one I mentioned earlier. A third one is to is to uh, sue or be su well, that's the second one. To sue or be sued. To take people to court or be taken to court. Again, operating as persons. And then the last two are first to as he puts it, to act and speak by a common seal. Actually, Hobbes had made a lot about that. He said whenever you've got a corporation or a corporate body, he was thinking of pre-corporation, you have someone who speaks in its name, and the members then rally behind the voice of the person who speaks in its name. It can be one person speaking on every facet of the corporation's business, the corporate body's business, or it could be one person on one aspect, another person on another aspect, where they are forced to be coherent with one another, or it could be subcommittees that speak on one or another aspect. And Hobbes's idea was that you get a corporate body when you get a voice that's constructed such that the members of the body agree that whatever is said by that voice on a given front, they are committed to, they will live up to, they will behave as if that was their voice as a corporate body, their voice as a corporate person, as they would have said. So that's the fourth voice, very forthright, very important to speak under the common seal and to make bylaw laws. That means to have laws about which, under which they can run themselves, like the laws under which we have a board of directors in the corporation, for example, that does its business. So really, by this time, the notion of the corporation is well and truly in existence, although there's one very specific thing that I must add. I'm not doing too much history, am I? But it's fun, the history. It's more fun than the philosophy, actually, in truth. <laughs> <laughs> at, at a certain level. Not as deeply intriguing, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> the thing that I must add is that in 1720, um, a law had been passed in England called the South Sea Bubble Act, uh, because people were worried the South Sea Company, which was still going pretty well, actually, when the act is passed, uh, has had shares that have ballooned. It's about to collapse. It's the Great South Sea Bubble, the first really great collapse in the English-speaking world. There have been one in previous to that in, in Holland. Um, but they're really worried about these companies suddenly developing because, you know, too many companies, the, especially the people in the South Sea Company, think it's too much competition. And so they persuade the government to pass an act, the South Sea Bubble Act, under which you can't form a corporation, a joint stock company, um, except by explicit act of parliament or explicit dictate of a king. Um, so that means they're very limited now in their rights. It's pretty hard to form one of these. Okay, now we fast forward and cross the Atlantic as well to America. Actually, Britain in 1825 changed the law about corporations and allowed corporations to be formed by just going to a notary, as it was said, and registering it as we form them now, which made them, of course, much easier to form and made them much more populous, as you can imagine. In England also, and now America tracks England very closely. It's not clear who's the leader in this. Actually, America fast becomes the leader. But what happens is that these new corporate bodies, which can be formed now much more easily, their rights are expanded enormously. So, for example, they can, having begun in textiles, they can become a bank overnight. They can change their sphere of activity, which had been limited. In America, for example, when they're set up in one state, they're given the right to operate not just in that state, but across the different states and territories of the new United States. They're also allowed to own one another. <clears throat> so you can have these corporate persons held in slavery, as it were, to other corporate persons. And of course, they're also, finally and famously, they're given rights of limited liability, or at least their members are, which means, as you know, that if a, there's a corporation that goes bankrupt, it fails financially, the debts do, cannot be laid against the members and their private funds, which is, of course, again, a great boost to corporate, uh, corporate developments. And corporations begin to thrive, particularly in America, because they're needed for the canals and they're needed for the railways. And these are the great big companies plus the banks that form. Now, one problem in America had been that <clears throat> if you had a company set up in one state, that state tended to favor its own companies and tended, in many cases, to tax companies 
from out of state, meaning from other states in the United States, more heavily than it taxed its own companies. And you can imagine that companies protested against this, and there were many court cases about it. It wasn't really resolved until 1886, when a famous Supreme Court judgment, well, it wasn't a judgment, actually, it was what they call an obiter dictum, it was a, it was a, a remark by the Supreme Court. We can maybe talk about that in Q&A if anybody's interested. And this remark really established a new jurisprudence and it solved that particular problem. But it solved the problem with a sledgehammer. It really made a remarkable sort of um, judgment or issued a, a, a remarkable obiter dictum um, that did solve the problem about corporations being allowed to um, do business in any state on equal terms with the corporations from that very state. And what they argued in this remark was that corporations as persons, and now you understand that from the tradition, corporations as persons were protected under the 14th Amendment of the United States, which had been brought in in 1868 in order to protect uh, the newly emancipated slaves. Um, there were three sections, if I remember to that amendment. The first two sections referred to clearly natural persons as the citizens and so on. And the last section says, and all persons shall be given, I think I have it here, equal protection. No state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Now think about it. This is the really clearly the founder are the people in the amendment meant individual human beings, but the court said, here's an easy out. We take this to mean corporate persons as well, and now we get over the problem that we've had about whether they can. But of course, by recognizing them as persons protected under the Constitution, you protect corporations now from the effects of legislation. So the Congress, the House of Congress and the President, they can do nothing against corporations insofar as they're judged by the courts, ultimately the Supreme Court, to be protected under the Constitution. That's why I describe it as a sledgehammer. This was, it's the only, I think, jurisdiction in the world where corporate persons, corporate bodies, but corporations in particular, are given this sort of protection. It, of course, raises the, uh, the question, I mean, they're equally protected across the states, but one reading of it is they're equally protected also with natural persons with human beings. And that's really been a source of a lot of legislation over the last, um, over the last 150 years, in, not legislation, of uh, um, ju jurisprudence over the last 150 years, culminating, you might say, in Citizens United. Uh, some people will say Citizens United was not about treating corporate bodies, corporations as persons, but rather about the quantity of speech. I actually think that's a superficial reading. I think it's one of many uh, decisions by the Supreme Court that followed on this jurisprudence, and it is basically saying they are corporate persons, they're protected under the First Amendment. The First Amendment is protect speech, but money is speech and politics, and so their spending of money is equally protected under the Constitution. This is truly a remarkable position that we've adopted uh, with, uh, with corporations in this country. But if you're going to sort of talk about this and, and, and argue for change, if you think change is due, or at least have some basis for determining what is the right and the wrong of it, we need a philosophical discussion of what rights should we give a corporate bodies in general, but corporations in particular. And that's my question. So the question is, should corporate bodies have legal rights in the same way as individual human beings? And I'm going to answer yes, no, and no. Yes, in one sense, yes, I say in the, same, in the same role, they should have rights as individual rights serve human agents, but no, not in the same, on the same basis and not to the same extent. And that's what I'm going to argue um, in, the, in, in this paper. <clears throat> I should say just though, to make absolutely clear about the, uh, about the argument, when I talk about rights here, I really mean rights in law. I mean legal rights. This is particularly important in a philosophical context where we talk so readily, well, not all of us do. I don't talk very readily about moral rights. I think it's a language that confuses more than it illuminates. But in any case, a lot of people think about rights as moral rights. Our question, rather, is what rights in law should corporations have? Of course, that is a moral question. It's a moral question about the law. 
So we think morally about the shape that the law ought to take. And the question is, what rights should the law give corporations? That's a question which we're focused. Of course, you might have different philosophical grounds or moral grounds on which you want to argue about that sort of question. One approach would be a consequentialist approach that says, well, look, you looked at the consequences of making the law this way or that way, of giving these or those rights to corporations, and you judge how the law should be, what rights it should give, by looking at the consequences. But I'm not going to argue that point of view here. For all I want to say today, you might take a more so-called non-consequentialist, deontological view about how you determine the shape that the law to assume. But in any case, it's a question about the shape that the law to assume. And of course, this <clears throat> it goes without saying that whenever you have law, the bodies that operate under the law, usually natural persons, are inevitably given certain rights. Whenever you have rules that dictate how agents behave, almost in any area, uh, you're going to establish rights for those agents. And so the question is here, insofar as the law governs corporate uh, corporations, what rights should they have? Just to make clear the point I, when I say that all laws establish rights, think about the rules of chess. That's a set of rules governing or laws governing, if you like, a particular sort of activity. By setting up rules of chess, you set up rights and restrictions, of course, for chess players. So for example, some rights are, I describe the rights in any set of rules set up as rights outside the rules, rights under the rules, and rights over the rules. So just with the laws of chess, the rules of chess, they establish, for example, various rights outside the rules in the following sense. If you read the rules of chess, they say nothing about whether you have to keep sitting down when you're playing chess, or whether you can get up and walk around while your opponent thinks about his move. So by default, so to speak, by virtue of the fact that the rules of chess say nothing about it, you have a, a, a right, because it's not governed by the rules at all, to get up and walk around while you play chess. Or you've got a right to blow your nose, you know, while the opponent is thinking about his or her move when you're playing chess. Those are rights outside the rules. I'm not going to be concerned about those default rights or privileges, sometimes call, people call them, outside the rules. I'm going to be concerned more with the rights that corporations should have under the rules of the law and over the rules of the law. But just to explain what they are, I mean, under the rules of chess, for example, you've got a right to move a bishop on the diagonal, to castle at a certain point in the game, and, and so on to the usual things. Those are design rights, not default rights. They're rights under the rules. Of course, as chess players, we don't have rights over the rules. We don't have rights to change the rules. But now moving back to law, clearly law gives us various rights. For example, it gives us, it gives us rights to do certain things and not be interfered with by others. That's a right given by the law, for example, to speak your piece on some matter without obstruction from others. Uh, but equal, that's a negative claim right, as we call it, that the law gives us. It's like the right of, of moving the diagonal, moving the bishop on a diagonal, if you like. But we also have also more positive rights, rights to, for example, under various systems of law, you have a, a right to be rescued by someone, um, a good Samaritan law, so-called. That's just a right, that's not just a right not to be interfered with in the exercise of something, a certain activity, but actually to be given help or resources by others. And of course, any welfare right under the law is a right against the government to be helped out in the case of need, for example, medical need or whatever. And the rights over rules are then like the rights that we have of citizens to contest the law, to take the government to court, for example, in the role of a private attorney, general attorney, as they say, um, and challenge the constitutionality of a law, or the right to speak out against laws that are passed, the right to protest against them, uh, the right to demonstrate and so on. These are all rights over the rules that we have. And of course, we equally have rights over the rules insofar as we've got immunities under, for example, the amendments. Um, we've got immunities against what the law can do to us. That's a right over the rules in the sense it restricts what form the rules may take. And of course, those who are in government have got the right provided the other House of Congress comes in line with them or, and the president and so on, to change the rules at a certain point. Anyhow, maybe all of that was unnecessary, but just to give you a sense that whenever you've got a set of rules, including a system of law, 
you always have rights given. Um, not just rights outside the rules, that goes without saying, but rights under the rules, whether negative or positive, and rights in relation to how the rules can be changed. Okay, and now the question is, what rights should corporations have under the law, rights to protection, etc., and what rights should they have over the law, rights to have a say in changing how the law is like? Okay, so my first uh, claim is, yes, corporations ought to enjoy legal rights in the same role as individuals. Let me warn you in advance, this is probably the most philosophical of the discussions that follow. So brace yourselves, sit up, and pay attention, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the question here is, the basis for my argument that, yes, they ought to have legal rights in, in this role is that corporations, corporate bodies in general, are agents, first of all, and secondly, that they're a very specific sort of agents, which I call conversable agents. So what do I mean by saying they're agents? Well, imagine, I've used this example before, for those of you who may have heard it, imagine you had, I, I brought a little apparatus here that um, uh, was a, a little robot on wheels, you could all see it, maybe it's that height or whatever, and it's got little bug-like eyes, you might say, that seem to swivel around. You go, well, what is this, you know? And then I put a bottle on the floor. I better not do this. It's not got the cap on. And I throw some bottles on the floor on the side, and I put others sitting upright. And I say, I plug in the device, or I turn it on, or whatever. And suddenly you see the eyes swivel. And as soon as it sees a, or as soon as there's a bottle on its side, you can see the eyes, you know, focus on the bottle. And then you can see the wheels begin to turn and it moves towards the bottle and these little robotic arms lift the bottle up and put it upright. And then the eyes swivel again and they find another bottle on its side, go to it, put it upright, and so on. And when all the bottles are upright, while it keeps scanning the room, it doesn't do anything. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to reckon that this system is an agent. Why is it an agent? Well, it's got a purpose as you see from its behavior, which is to put bottles or maybe oblong objects of any sort of that kind on their upright rather than on their side. And you can see that it doesn't just go as we're haywire moving its arms and whenever it catches one of these things happening, we put it upright. No, it forms a representation of its environment that identifies when there are bottles on the ground and when there are not that are on, on, on their side. And when it does find one, it registers it pretty reliably, and then it reliably goes and it puts the bottle upright again. So that illustrates what an agent is. An agent is just a system, at least when things are normal, that operates in the following way. It's got purposes that it realizes in a way that makes sense according to representations that it forms. It acts in an executively reliable way, if you want to put it that way, on the basis of representations that it forms in an evidentially reliable way. It forms representations fairly like it really does see any bottle on the ground. Of course, it can be fooled. You could have a picture of a bottle there, maybe to fool our little robot. But in general, it's pretty good at detecting when there is a bottle and when there's not, and when the bottle is on its side and when it's upright. It reliably forms representations, and then those representations guide it in pursuing its purpose. Now, that notion of an agent, a system that pursues purposes according to representations, with this reliability. Of course, every animal is like that. Um, if you think about the dog or the cat or the cow or the wild animal, you can think it's a system. It's got many more purposes, of course, than the robot that I've imagined has. But in general, it's going to pursue those purposes, whatever they are, according to representations. The dog, you know, is sitting in the backyard, and you hear a squeak, and you see the dog's ears go up, you know? And you can almost see it forming the belief, hey, they're home, you know? <laughs> and then going to greet them or going for supper or whatever the purpose of the dog is and going running to the, the front gate. I mean, that's a system that's operating like the robot, okay? Now, we human beings are like that too, of course. We've got purposes, although many, many more than even the animals, certainly than the robots. And we pursue the purposes according to representations that we form about the opportunities, the means available, the obstacles, and the order of importance among our purposes, for example. But now when you think about corporate bodies and corporations in particular like BP or Volkswagen or 
um, or General Motors or whatever, th pick your favorite, or indeed, of course, any corporate body like a university, for example, it's a body that has purposes in every case. And it's a body like it might be just making profit or it might be expanding in this area or that, or it might be changing um, you know, its mode of activity to, say, natural gas from oil. And whenever it's got purposes like this, it forms representations via, of course, its members and the sub-bodies, the committees that its members form. But they feed up, and it pursues these purposes pretty reliably in accordance with these representations, which themselves, if things are going well, are going to be formed pretty reliably as well. So it's an agent. And that's the first thing you've got to have clear, I think, that corporations are agents, if you're thinking about the question of should they have, should they have rights. Who denies that there are agents? Well, are there any economists in the audience? I know there are some. There are some economists, not all by any means, but there are some economists who have been in the habit of saying corporations are just particularly dense markets. You think about a market, a market, we talk about the market maybe um, losing faith in a certain commodity or expecting such and such, but we know that is, that is just metaphorical talk. We don't think of markets as agents because they don't have purposes that they systematically pursue. They don't have means of forming representations qua markets. And the, there's one line that goes, look, at markets, are, corporations are just people who've made contracts with one another, as people make contracts with one another in the market, except they're particularly dense and encompassing contracts that are made with one another. And the line goes, so they're just webs of contracts, a nexus of contracts. This is a mantra that you keep finding in the economic textbooks, and therefore not an agent. That's a terrible argument. There's not really an argument you often find. It's just passed off as a remark. But if it's an argument, it's of the following form. Markets, are, markets and corporations are made up of contractual relations, but markets are not agents, so therefore corporations are not agents. Just to see how bad an argument that is, think about an analogy. Dogs and trees are both formed of cells, cellular relations, if you like. But trees are not agents, therefore dogs are not agents. It's a terrible argument. It's, it's a non sequitur. So I say that's the only op serious opposition I know to the notion of corporations being agents. So I say they are agents. But to move to my second point, <clears throat> they're very special sorts of agents. Remember I mentioned about Hobbes that Hobbes said that you form a corporation and a corporate body in general insofar as you establish a voice behind which the members rally, so to speak. So the voice, let's say, of the CEO or of the management committee or on the marketing front, the voice of the marketing organ, which is authorized by the rest of the company, or the voice of the, you know, the pay office or whatever and some other issue, the payroll office. Uh, these voices are authorized by the members as a whole however you think of the membership. And people behave as those voices actually say, so to speak, they will behave. That makes a big difference between corporations, for example, and mute agents, like animals other than human beings in general seem to me to be, postpone the objection to the Q&A, mute agents as robots, at least as we know them, are mute agents. Corporations are like us because we're not mute agents. We also talk for ourselves, we speak for ourselves. And that's worth thinking about for a moment, and this is maybe the most philosophical remark I'm going to make. When we speak for ourselves to one another, we don't just report what our beliefs are. We communicate to one another what we think, we communicate to one another what our intentions are, what our desires are, what our values are, and we enable one another to anticipate what we will do on the basis of this communication of attitudes, right? We'll all agree with that, that's no problem. But there's something about this communication that's particularly important, and that's the following. When I say what I believe, I don't just say, uh, I think that's what I believe. I mean, you might ask me what David Copp believes, and I say, let's take an issue out of the blue. Um, is Davis campus smaller or larger than a square mile? Okay, I've been around it a bit. I'm prepared to suggest it's larger than a square mile, let's suppose. Is it? Oh, 
Good, so nobody knows, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but now imagine you're asked to, do you believe that it's larger than the square mile? You don't say, oh, what do I believe on that? You don't look into your head, right, to ask yourself what you believe. It's not a matter of introspection. What you do is you ask, well, is it larger than a square mile? And then if you can summon up evidence that means it is, you report, yeah, it's larger than a square mile. Or you say, yeah, I believe it's larger than a square mile. That's how you communicate the attitude. Now, notice when you do that. So I say to you, my belief is that it's larger than a, a, a square mile. Notice that I'm not just reporting my belief, like I might report the belief of a third person. You ask me, does David Kopp believe that it's larger than a square mile? Well, I might say, does he? Yeah, I'm sure I heard him say that the other day, or commit himself to some bet that implied that it was. And so, yeah, yeah, he does. But now suppose later David doesn't act as if it were that big, say, in putting a bet. And you complain to me. You say, you misled me about, about David Kopp. He doesn't believe that. I can give one of two excuses, can't I, straight off. One, I can say, well, I gather that he actually changed his mind. You know, I have asked him now. It turns out that he did believe it, and I was correct. And that lets me off the hook, right? You've got no complaint. But the other excuse I can give is that, <clears throat> assuming he didn't change his mind, I can give the following excuse. Well, you know, I really did have evidence to think that that's what he believed. And I must have misread that evidence, or the evidence must have been misleading. I must have misheard when I heard him, as I thought, say that it's larger than a square mile. OK, so that's a sort of misleading evidence or misleading mind. His mind is misleading from my point of view excuse. Now, when I speak for myself and I tell you what I believe, as in you asked, is it larger? And I said, yeah, it's larger than a square mile. Now it turns out that I don't act as if it were, and you complain to me about my having miscommunicated my belief. I can, if it's true, excuse myself by pointing out that I changed my mind since then, that new evidence came my way. But what I can't do is say, you know, that's funny. I must have misread my mind when I told you it's larger. Now, why is that? Because I made up my mind, didn't I? When you, you know, I didn't introspect when you asked me, is it? I just thought about the matter of fact. Made a judgment, made up my mind. And so there was no way in which I could have misread my mind. I made up my mind. I had a maker's knowledge, as you might put it, of my mind, not an observer's knowledge of my mind. Now, when I, when I communicate in that way, my belief is, let's use a word for that, I avow the belief. I don't report the belief. So I close off one assumption. And that means, of course, that I'm, it's a more expensive remark to avow belief. Had you asked me and I'd said, Hey, I don't know what I believe in that. I think I believe in so. Well, then later, if I didn't act according to it, I could reasonably say, you know, I, well, as I indicated, I was trying to find out or think about what I believe, and I couldn't make up my mind about what I believed. But if I say, I make up my mind and I report, yes, it's larger, and convey the belief in that way, I can't use that, must have misread, can't use the misleading mind excuse. That means that when I communicate my belief in that way to you, and I think it might be a belief about the existence of God, or it might be a belief about you know, who's going to win the next election, or a belief about you know, a matter of some importance to us, whether Jones is trustworthy, right? And you go ahead and, and trust him on the basis of what I say. So it's very important to you that I closed off one excuse, because that I made the words are often cheap, but a vowel, words spoken in a vowel are more expensive than words spoken in report. So it's a, a sort of commitment on my side. I'm going to be subject to a sanction. I'm going to be more readily exposed to blame, to being on the hook, if I mislead you, because I won't be able to avail myself of the, of the misleading mind excuse, only of the change mind excuse. Of course, I might go one better, and I might actually shut down the change mind excuse as well. So for example, you ask me, are you going to the movies tonight? Well, I could avow the intention by saying, yeah, th that's my intention to be there. And if I don't turn up, and you say, look, you said you'd be at the movies. And I said, well, look, I changed my intention. I changed my mind. And that's OK. It's just like avowing the belief, because I had just avowed the intention. But if I say, OK, you can depend on me. I'll be there. Or I formally say, I promise to be there. Well, then later, if I don't turn up, not only can I not invoke the misleading evidence or misleading mind excuse that I misread my own intention, 
Neither can I invoke the I change my mind excuse because I made, an, uh, I made a, a promise. Of course, there are external sorts of excuses I can give, like I broke a leg on the way to the, you know. But with these two types of excuses, I shut both of them down when I give a promise. So it's very expensive, a promise, a very expensive way of communicating your mind. And of course, thereby, you make yourself more reliable. And this is a very important way about how you relate socially, that we avow our attitudes and we pledge our promise, our actions. To say we're conversable agents is to say that we do just that, and what's more, we can be taken at our word in general. So you can form relations with this person, you can do business with this person, because as they speak so in general, they act. When they avow belief, they'll generally live up to it. When they pledge or promise an action, they'll generally take it. That's someone you can do business with, someone who's conversable in the old phrase. Now the thing about corporations and corporate bodies more generally actually, is that they aspire to be conversable agents. Not only are they agents, you know, in the thin sense I describe, being systems with purposes that they pursue according to representations they form, they speak for those attitudes. They communicate them. And they communicate them in the expensive way, not just reporting about themselves as if they could. When the spokesperson speaks for the corporation and says, this is our belief, this like is in the mission statement or whatever, or a belief about a matter of fact, about how the markets are going to go, about you know, how our shares are being valued or whatever, they can't say, oh, I must have gotten the corporate view wrong when I said that. You can't say that, right? Because the spokesperson is held to speak for the corporation, to avow the belief of the corporation. And the shareholders can't say, oh, well, he, he said that's what the corporation believed, but we don't believe it, you know, so you can't hold us to us. That's not the rules of the game. The rules of the game are that you're bound by the words, in the avowal sense of the spokesperson, in a way that you're each, under the rules of the game of interpersonal exchange, bound by the words you yourself utter when you avow attitudes or pledge them. And equally, when a corporation enters a contract, it makes a promise a pledge as to how it will behave under various circumstances, and should it not live up to that, it's on the hook. Of course, like individual human beings, it can be on the hook informally, I say, well, I'm not going to that, go to that company anymore, or formally under the law, I mean, as in it may be exposed to, to legal sanction. So two points I've argued about corporations, one, they're agents, and two, they're conversable agents. Now, the third point is really one that follows from that second one which is to say that if we're going to establish corporations and we're going to have them act under the law, that's to say not like the mafia, for example, which operates outside the law and we don't recognize it as having any rights, if we're going to establish corporations, it has to be clear to them and it has to be clear to us that there are certain things they can, they can do and can't do and that they can make promises only within the range of the things that they are allowed to do under the rules. And if there weren't rules that gave them, you know, both rights and restrictions that defined for them the things they could legitimately do under the law, then they couldn't make plans and we couldn't believe any plans that they announce. So they really couldn't operate as conversable agents among us. Their being conversable agents means that if they're going to operate under the rule of law, as part of our community, that we individually relate to, that we sometimes form, and so on. If they're going to be like that, then they have to be given rights under the law that makes clear what they can and cannot do, as we say, with impunity. That's to say, without legal redress. And that's my first claim, that they should be given rights in the same role as we are given rights. Because as agents, we need to know, for example, what our rights and restrictions are under the law if we're going to relate to one another. We need to know that you can speak your mind on matters of politics in public without fear of redress, something you can't do, for example, in China. You don't have that legal right in China. You have it in the United States. Or you have the right to associate with anyone who will associate with you, except, of course, for criminal purposes or whatever, but for purposes that are not themselves, you have that right, and you know you have that right, so you can plan your life, so to speak. These are rights that you need qua conversable agent. You make promises to someone. That makes sense only if it's a matter of common knowledge between you that this is an area within which you have the right to commit yourself and the right to act 
as you are promising to act. And the same thing holds exactly for corporations. I call these agential rights. They're different from the rights, for example, you might give animals, or children for that matter, which are protective rights that don't suppose that these bearers of the rights are full agents, let alone conversable agents. And they've got rights because they're vulnerable, we want to protect them and the rules protect them. But the rights that corporations have are actually agential rights, just like the rights that we need in law in order to perform properly as natural persons. So yes on that first issue. So now having defended those, um, that positive answer, I want to argue for two negative lines. The two remaining questions are, so yes, maybe they can be given rights in the same role, to the same purpose, if you like, um, as individual human beings, but should they be given to corporations on the same basis on which they're given to individual human beings? That's the first question. And secondly, should they be given with the same extension, you know, with the same extent, same richness, uh, as they're given to individual human beings? And I'm going to answer no to each of those questions. Okay, it'd be nice to have a bit of history at this point, but I don't have any history to throw in. You know, it's a light relief from the, <laughs> from the relentless uh, uh, aridity of philosophy. I mean, philosophy is great, but I, I agree it can be a bit dry, it can be a bit arid, you know. So take a deep breath, you know, we're, we're more or less out of the, the heavier waters or the denser air of, of or the rarer air of, of philosophical argument. Well, we're almost, because I do have to rely on a, a philosophical argument when it comes to the basis on uh, this basis question. So why let me, let's ask ourselves, why do we, what's the basis on which we give individual human beings agential rights? We give individual human beings, of course, protective rights like we give to children uh, because we are so vulnerable as organic creatures and so on. But why do we give one another, give ourselves, as a community, give each of us, as an individual, um, various um, agential rights. And obviously the reason is that we feel we cannot function properly as conversable agents, we can't realize ourselves, our purposes, we can't achieve what we think individual natural persons like us human beings should aim to achieve unless we're given an assured degree of latitude as to what we can do. If we're restricted in what we can do and where we can move, for example, and who we can associate with, in whether we can speak our minds, in what religion we can practice, we're hemmed in, you know, as human beings. So this is a sort of obvious point, I guess, whether you're utilitarian or a romantic or a republican or whatever, you're going to think individual human flourishing requires that we have these individual, these uh, agential rights that give us the space that we know we can act in and we can pursue our our own destinies and our relations with others and so on. So it's our, so to speak, status as individual conversable agents that provides the basis on which we think we should be given the rights we are given, or should be given at any rate, within the law under which we operate. Now, if you thought the same about corporate agents, what you think is the following. Well, corporate agents, corporations, are equally agents with their own purposes and so on that form these purposes, the representations. And you know, they should be allowed to thrive in the same way as individual human beings are allowed to thrive. And if you took that line, you'd be saying that they should be given rights on the same basis on which we individual human agents are given rights that is necessary for corporate flourishing. These agents will thrive and prosper, so to speak, in the way we contrive and prosper, only if they're given the sort of rights that we are given. That would be to say they should be given rights on the same basis. I want to argue against that now. What I want to argue, just to spoil, so to speak, the suspense, I know that you're hung on, um, <laughs> what I want to argue is that they should be given rights with a view to the welfare and the thriving and the flourishing of individual human beings not of the corporate beings or the corporate agents themselves. So they should be given rights on a different basis, on the basis of how other agents, we natural persons, um, on the basis of our needs, not their needs, if you like. And here's the argument. There are sort of two, two sides to the argument. So the, the first argument I've set out here in, 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 three in three parts. So the first claim is this. 
What happens when you give a corporation rights? For example, what happens when you give a corporation the right that enables its members to enjoy limited liability? So their personal resources can't be pursued by debtors in the event of the corporate body going bankrupt. Well, really, when you do that, what you do is you give individual human beings, the shareholders in this case, the right to associate with one another in a certain way. To give, any corporate, to give a corporation or corporate body any rights at the corporate level is always, under another description, to give the individuals involved in that corporation the right to associate in a certain manner. Okay, I hope that I'm going to take that as being relatively clear. So maybe uh, let's take, um, let's take any, any example. The right of a corporation, for example, to change its area of activity, its sphere of activity, say from textiles to banking in the extreme example I gave earlier. Well, all that is really is the right of the members of the corporation, in particular the um, shareholders in this case, to associate with one another to the purpose of either banking or textile manufacture or preparation or whatever, depending on what their collective wish is. So you're just giving individuals rights of association of a certain kind. And if you take any corporate right, you can always see it as depending upon being constituted by, in effect, the rights of individuals to associate in a certain way. That's my first premise. Second premise, we don't give individual rights, individuals unlimited rights to associate with one another to just any effect they like. So for example, we don't give individuals the right to associate with one another to a criminal purpose. We don't even give uh, them a right to associate with one another in forming a gang of a certain kind. Um, we, don't give, we don't give them a right, for example, the owners, let them be individuals for the moment, the right to form a cartel you know, that will fix the price in a competitive market. We say that form of association should be limited. Now, why do we think it should be limited in that case? For example, you know, under US laws, you know the antitrust legislation, the Sherman Act, for example, and other acts. Um, corporations themselves, but equally individuals, are not allowed to form a cartel to fix the price. Why do we think that should be the case? Well, because we think that the benefits of having a free market are actually compromised if you allow the producers, the suppliers, in any area of the market to fix the price at which the goods are available, because the benefits of a competitive market are supposed to be that the suppliers and producers will drive the price down in the search for consumers who want to buy as cheaply as possible for a given level of quality. And so the benefit is presumably that they, so we don't allow them associate, right? So that establishes that we don't give either individuals or corporate bodies an unlimited right of association, okay? We limit the rights of association in various ways, and we do so with a view to individual human welfare, right? Or fairness, for that matter. So, for example, you don't give, let it be an individual at the moment, a producer, the right to, uh, to price things at a predatory level, you know, to, because he's bigger, or she's bigger, or it's bigger than a competitor, to price things at a level that means they're suffering a loss overall, but that they can survive, say, in a period of a year, but the competitors can't. They go out of business if they've got to compete. But when you put the competitors out of business, you then raise the price back to, and you've, of course, got a monopoly at that point. We don't give that right either. So we all the time limit rights. Now, what I say is that if we limit rights of association with a view to human welfare, and if giving rights to corporations is just giving rights of association to individual human beings, then it follows that we're certainly entitled to limit the rights of corporations, that's to say the rights of association of the members of those corporations, with a view to human welfare. And that really gives me the bottom line I want to defend. But we all find intuitive that we should take the lines I've just described, limit rights of association, and therefore rights of corporations with a view to individual human welfare. That's the line I want to argue. That seems consistently with points that we all 
accept the ones that I've just given, for example, in particular in the first premise, consistently with those points, it seems perfectly natural that we should say, yes, corporations should have rights, that was the first argument, but of course they should only be given such rights as are consistent with the welfare of people in the society as a whole, where they're, of course, considered as equals in the society as a whole, or perhaps indeed outside the society, but I'm going to stick to the domestic society we're talking about. So that seems to give me directly the answer. We should fix the rights of corporations, not with a view to how good it is for corporations, but rather with a view to how good it is for individuals, right? Because corporate rights are just rights of individual association. We all agree rights of individual association should be fixed with a view to the good of individuals overall. So it follows as perfectly natural that the rights of corporations should be fixed to the good of individuals overall. But there's a second phase of the argument, because someone might object to that as follows. Well, wait a moment. Aren't people who get together to create a corporation, aren't they just like parents, as it were, who get together to procreate a child? And isn't there an analogy that goes against my argument of the following kind? Once a child is born and begins to be raised and come to be adult, I mean, initially, the rights of the child are severely limited in relation to the adults, but once the child, as we say, can stand on its own two feet, metaphorically, not literally, uh, we think that the child should have the same rights as the adult. And so someone might object to my argument by saying that, well, look, okay, people create these corporations, but once the corporations are created, aren't they now free of those who create them in the way in which the child is free of the adults? And should they then, shouldn't they then be able to claim rights in their own name once they, once they exist? And my argument against this is really that that seems to be something of a fool's errand. It would have extraordinarily counterintuitive implications that none of us could seriously take into account. So here's an implication. People form a partnership. Now, as we know from the example I gave earlier, partnerships have fewer rights than joint stock companies, than corporations, because there isn't a right of asset lock-in. Normally, they're not all of those, there isn't a right of limited liability either. There are various rights. So now imagine that we get together and form a partnership. And now there it is, grown up like a child. And the partnership, if you can imagine it speaking to its partners, as we're like a separate agent, says, hey, I should have more rights than this, you know? I mean, I'm a freestanding agent now, so you should make me a, a joint stock company, for example, not just a partnership. I mean, that would be utterly crazy. It would be say people don't have the right now to form partnerships. Because once they find the partnership, the partnership would suddenly sprout a right of its own to become a joint stock company. So people wouldn't have the right to form anything less than the most full-fledged uh, of corporate agents, which is utterly crazy. So I take it that this suggests that, yes, they should have rights, first argument, but surely it makes perfect sense to think that the rights they should have should be limited to the rights that are basically for the benefit of individual human beings in the society where those individual human beings are, are considered as equals. Now, I've got about five minutes if I'm going to stick to my promised 55 minutes, so let me just go quickly through the last answer. The question you might still raise is, well, maybe they should be given rights on these bases, but it could turn out, someone might say, it could turn out that actually the rights they should be given for the sake of the welfare of individuals should still be extremely rich rights, you know, very extensive rights, maybe even more than the rights that individual human beings have. Of course, that's pretty outlandish, pretty counterintuitive anyhow, but here's a thought that makes it clear that almost certainly they couldn't, which is that, first of all, by allowing corporations to form and giving them more and more rights, you may benefit the shareholders. You may even, if the corporation is organized in a certain way, benefit the employees. But you sure as anything, as you increase the rights of corporations, you're very unlikely to benefit other human beings in the society. So that the welfare of those individuals as a whole is going to call for a reduction in the rights of the corporations. Now let me make this just a little bit more concrete by saying that there are three aspects, as I see it, under which in particular considerations of welfare, in particular considerations of fairness to human beings, argue for certain important limitations on the rights of corporations. 
I call these three considerations considerations of internal fairness, considerations of social fairness, and considerations of political fairness. Considerations of internal fairness are that the rights of a corporation should be such that within the corporation, no one should have the right to, um, well now, stick in your favorite term, but to, in a certain way, abuse other members of the corporation um, to do them damage. For example, I would say, David mentioned the Republican sort of approach earlier, the right to dominate, to stand over with asymmetrical power that really gives the lower person no capacity to look the first person in the eye without reason for fear or deference. Internal fairness, I would say, requires that the members of a corporation or a body should not be dealt with so unfairly, unfairly internal, internally to the body. Myself, I think that that argues, for example, that we should not have, the managers in a corporation should not have the right to fire at will, without cause, within a corporation, because so long as they have that right, the people who depend on not being fired at the will of the manager have to, as it were, keep the manager sweet. Um, they're under all sorts of constraints. Um, they can't look the manager in the eye without reason for fear or deference. Contrast that with the situation in many countries where you can fire people, of course, but only for cause, and cause is determined by putting it through maybe a works council committee, or maybe an adjudication committee of an outside kind, an arbitration uh, tribunal of some kind. Uh, firing is not by no means very difficult, but it means that a manager can't exercise a sort of arbitrary power within the corporation. So I would say that's an example of a right we do give corporations that actually I would argue against on my preferred um, normative theory, which is this Republican uh, notion of freedom as non-domination. Social fairness. Well, by giving corporations, they have great economic power in general. They also have amazing psychological power. If you ever try to take a corporation to court, even in a class action, you'll quickly realize that corporations realize they live more or less forever. They can go on and on. So they can keep appealing the case or whatever. And they have no emotional anxiety. You know, it's a different person handling the case at each point. There's no one suffering the fear of death or illness or anxiety in taking them to court. So there's a great social unfairness. Not only that, but the costs they pay when they go to court, when you take them to court or they take you to court, are counted as business costs that can be offset against tax, whereas you can't offset your costs against tax under IRS rules. Someone once said, in defending the equality of corporations and individuals before the law, well, you can take a corporation, you can have your day in court, you can take a corporation to court. Mark Galanter in the nice remark says, that's a little bit like saying, human beings and sharks can both swim, <laughs> without adding, but sharks are in the swimming business, you know? <laughs> so there's a, an enormous unfairness of a social kind that corporations enjoy in our society, and we've, we've doled out these rights to them without, I think, any second thought. And I think that really does require second thought. Third sort of rights are political rights. These are rights over the rules, you remember, rights over the... Now, traditionally, and in most countries, corporations are very limited in what they can do in politics. Um, although in no country are they wholly limited, because a corporation can always um, use the threat of moving elsewhere when they're big employers, and unemployment is always politically unpopular, to, as it were, have an inside track of influence on politicians. Not only do they have that in our country, of course, like elsewhere, because you can move between states and so on, or indeed you can move out of state. Take, for example, um, is it G, uh, GE or GM will move into Canada, one of their branches because of the import-export bank being... Now, whatever you think about that piece of proposed legislation or delegislation, um, this is a case of where there's a direct threat by corporate... And they have enormous power whether you want it or not. But in our country, of course, especially since this is united, they now have extraordinary power which is, by the way, controlled, because it normally doesn't go before the annual shareholders' meeting, controlled by those at the helm. They have a right of basically seeking favors. With poli I mean, who in this room thinks that politicians don't know who supports them and aren't favorable towards those who support them? But not only that, in this country, we actually give them the right of financing the campaigns of judges who are seeking re-election. And we have figures that tell us there's a direct correlation 
between how often a court finds against a corporation and how far that corporation has actually provided support for the campaigns of the judges in case. I mean, these are really, these shriek to high heaven, in my view, and we have insufficient sensitivity to them. So it's really important we think about the rights that we give corporations, but it's equally important that we recognize they should be given only in the basis of individual human welfare, and in particular with a view to the forms of unfairness, internal, social, and political, that giving excessive rights can cause. So I better stop at that point. That's my yes, no, and no line. Thank you. Will you take the questions? Because I hate taking my own questions. It seems unfair. I can, I can pick those I know or pick those I think will ask a nice question, you know. One thing you said that I can't help you, you. you said that corporations have some um, advantages such that their exercise of their rights can hurt society. Uh, for example, you think of Citizens United this way, you think that uh, corporate political speech can hurt the democratic process by, by um, giving too much power to, to certain voices that are well. And the, the Supreme Court actually said this in the Austin case in the 80s. Of course, yes. Citizens United overturn, expressly overturned that case. And Citizens yeah. United, they Agreed. said that, well, be that as it may, um, the court said what's more important is the value to society. If corporations can speak, then that enlightens society by hearing more voices. And therefore, um, there is no social just welfare justification for regulating corporates. So if you buy that, then the social welfare as being the limitation, then you lack a, a justification for limit. Um, I would argue that there's another dimension to corporate rights, which you do allude to in your speech, uh, which is the associational nature. And that can be independent um, justification for limitation. If corporate, the corporate right to speak, if all corporate rights are, are not based on their agential, agential nature, but based on their status as representatives of the members, then if their speech is harmful to members, you have a justification to them. So, for, and so the argument is made against Citizens United that if a corporation supports um, a certain candidate for a, for a position, political position and its shareholders or its employees disagree, then it's harming the rights of those people. And that's the separate just that I would argue Supreme Court doesn't buy this, but I would argue that this is a separate justification for limiting, even if you buy the, the, the lack of a, a general social welfare. So I, I just want to. So it's very interesting. The argument was the quantity of speech argument in the in the Citizens United case. because it, it, it does appeal, as you say, to the welfare of society as a whole. And the idea is, I mean, it, it seems to me extraordinarily specious reasoning. I mean, I'm not a lawyer. You are, Tom. But uh, I, I can't even make up my mind around how they could have been persuaded by this thought that the more speech there is, the better, because people hear different points of view. But money is speech, so the more money the corporations spend, the better off people are because they hear more speech, especially given that this money is channeled to people who will only defend the, who are committed to defending the, I mean, I know you're not defending it. Yeah, but you make the good point that they actually, in that particular argument, buy into the notion it should be the welfare of individuals. They don't use explicitly the corporate person's status of corporations in that argument. I actually think they do implicitly assume that because, <clears throat> But some people have made the following, have made the following comment that this isn't united argument there. It's like saying, if you had a waterfall of speech, you know, that just generated political speech out into the society, then, you know, we should have as many such waterfalls as possible. But, and now this is a philosophical point, but every philosopher will recognize that sort of argument, that just by producing noises that sound like speech doesn't mean producing speech. There's got to be a speaker there, and there's got to be a discipline of coherence before it's speech. So you've got to assume that the corporate agent that's speaking really is a person. So you have to have strong assumptions there. But anyhow, that's a, that's, that's a detail. Now, your second point, 
Um, I think that is right. I mean, myself, I take the following view, that there should be limitations on uh, both the limit, the amount of money that privately can be invested in political causes that are at least close to election or close to parties or candidates, and that there should also be requirements of disclosure, which both of which we've now thrown out effectively. I mean, not totally, but almost, uh, almost. That applies to individuals as well as corporations. So you might say my argument at that point is as much against individual political spending as it is corporate spending. But there is a special argument that you've just pointed it out in the case of corporations, which is these bodies are not formed for political purposes. The Austin case distinguished between bodies formed in which the members get together in order to put a particular political point of view, um, and a corporation, where the corporation people are in there, they often don't know what their corporation is doing because they have invested a small amount or it's, they're invested elsewhere as well. And really you're, what you've done is given a sort of privilege to those at the top to spend other people's money without really being accountable to the shareholders in support of whatever they judge to be in the best interests of their company in, um, in, in, in potential lawmaking. And that is a special objection to corporations having that right. Please keep your questions concise because we're short of time. Uh, yes. So then, uh, here you, uh, to argue for your main thesis, uh, you first argue that agents, uh, the corporate bodies are agents, and you call it uh, uh, corporate realism. And yeah. I'm wondering whether the Von Fresen's argument against scientific realism might have a version against your corporate realism. So let me quickly sketch how that might work. Yeah. So you make a very strong metaphysical claim, namely corporate bodies are agents. Then Van Fresen, uh, pretend that Van Fresen is a political philosopher, and he would say, oh, we don't know. We don't need to be committed to such a strong claim. Let's suspend our judgment concerning whether corporate bodies are agents. But then you offer your reasons. And they, oh, they, 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 they look like they are conversable agents. Then I guess um, that Van Fresen will probably respond as follows. Oh, yeah, uh, your reasons uh, should be actually, should be used to support the following thesis. Corporate bodies ought to be treated, treated as if they were agents. They were conversable agents, and therefore yeah. they were, uh, they ought to, uh, in a counterfactual sense, they ought to enjoy legal rights, right? So I'm just curious on what you would want to respond okay, so to this guy. Here's where I'm going to be very concise in the answer, because I suspect not everybody in the audience knows von Frassen's uh, anti-realism about scientific entities. I think there is a big difference that von Frassen is thinking about entities that are unobservable, right? Whereas what it is to be a, a conversable agent, as in the case of a corporate body, is not something that's unobservable. It's a pattern that the body is saying. That I am an agent and a conversable agent is something that's manifest. It's not, a, it's a, it's not sort of hidden in the way in which the presence of quarks are hidden when we look at a physical object or even look at one of us. It's not a, an unobservable entity my agency or my conversable agency is manifest in how I behave. And similarly with corporate bodies, their agency and their conversable agency is totally manifest. So I, I, I see a difference there that means the Van Frassen line doesn't, doesn't run. But a very interesting suggestion that we can talk about it further. I am in, from economics. No one's perfect. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, a joke, I love the economists, I co-author with them. <laughs> yeah. The Davis era is much more than a square model. <laughs> yeah, all right, okay, oh good, oh good. <laughs> Did I understand the only text we have is the 14th Amendment? The only what? To, the, the only text we have equating a corporation with an individual is in the 14th Amendment interpretation of what they mean by any person. Well, the idea of 
corporate but that's bot. the only text we have. You said something about it was yes. and put in the Constitution. I don't know about that. The founders of the Constitution are those who entered the 14th Amendment did not have corporations in mind. That's pretty clear. They had emancipated slaves in mind when they wrote the 14th Amendment. In jurisprudence, more generally, corporate bodies had always been treated as persons for the reasons I was trying to trace, back to Blackstone and so on. And what happened with that court in 1886, actually it's a very interesting case. The, um, the court, uh, Southern Railways were brought to court by Santa Clara County, quite near here, I understand. And they were brought to court on the following grounds, that they didn't pay their full tax. That's not what I was asking, I'm sorry. I was asking, is there a text outside the 14th Amendment, a text, in the Constitution? Well, no, in the Constitution, the court invoked that amendment and that particular section. So it's in, in the interpretation? In the, the interpretation. Amendment. Yes. And There's nothing about is. corporations in that's the Constitution. That's all there is in the Constitution. Now, if I accept that indeed corporations are like individuals, then all the examples you give there, those are all restrictions for the individuals. So that the individuals and the corporations have the same right, but both, both are restricted by your economic criterion. Let's look at the welfare. This is Welfare economics, we call that. Oh, that's a well. <laughs> I was abstracting from how you understand welfare, as I think I say in the handout, however welfare and fairness are interpreted, the following is so. But you could run a welfare economic standard, traditional line, if you like, on this. But what I want to say is individual human beings, in order to achieve human welfare overall, individual human beings have to have a whole range of rights, including free speech rights, free association rights, and political rights of voting or standing for office. But corporations, for example, do not have rights of standing for office. No one thinks they have that. And they do not have rights of, of, um, of voting. And they do not have rights of not being owned by corporations which, you know, corporations can be owned by other corporations. And I want to say that's all to the good because human individual welfare argues for that. So it's the same premise. We should look after human welfare with individuals because it's equals. But that argument argues for giving individual human beings a rich set of rights, but giving corporate bodies a more limited set of rights. So it's the same premise but giving you different rights for these two uh, sets of agents. We have time for one more question. Oh, only one. Oh. Uh, so this question uh, presupposes that individual human beings have natural rights. If you reject the uh, presupposition, we'll get sidetracked. Let's just drop it. But if you accept the presupposition, is it obvious, is there an argument that corporations have rights, but they don't have natural rights? And if the answer to that is, uh, is yes, then uh, I would think that would be an interesting analytic tool that could yeah. be used to work out some of the details that you have been, you've been touching, touching on. So if you agree with the supposition, any, any comment that right. might, might be interesting. OK, so here's my comment. Um, remember I said that we were talking about rights under law, that both natural persons and corporate persons should have. And I said, that's a moral question about what the law should be like. And I said, you could, for example, think that that moral question is to be decided on consequentialist lines, that the law should assume a form and should give such rights to these two sorts of agents, as are, for example, for the best in terms of the consequences overall downstream for individual human beings. But I mentioned you could have a non-consequentialist approach. You might think that the law should assume such a form and should give such rights to certain agents, not as promote the best consequences, but rather as, say, for example, fit with the natural rights of individual human beings. And that would actually, I think, argue very quickly in favor of different legal rights for individual human beings from the rights given to corporations because 
no one thinks the corporations have natural rights. That would sort of be, I mean, I know no one in the world who's ever said anything like that. Um, so actually, if I can get qu more quickly to my conclusion if I were to assume that the way in which to debate the legal rights that entities should have is to go to natural rights, because those are only going to be the natural rights of individual human beings, and that means that what I call normative humanism in the handout, the argument that we should always look to the welfare of human beings in determining the rights of corporate bodies, that's going to follow automatically because the only possible reference point is going to be natural rights and they do belong only to individual human beings. So it's just going to give me an even quicker route to my conclusion. Alas, from this point of view, I don't believe in natural rights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much for a very interesting talk. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.